Welcome back. This is the Intel on ENCA. I'm in conversation with the National Director of Public Prosecutions, Shamila Batoy, about corruption and state capture related uh, cases. Uh, Advocate Batoy, so I hear what you're saying that some of these cases take time to evolve and for all the you know, for you to dot your I's and cross your T's so that you present a case that is solid before a, a, a judge or a magistrate, whatever the mm -hmm. case may be. South Africans watching will be saying there have been so many of these cases laid, particularly around, let's talk state-owned enterprises, for example. We've seen the work that has been going on around ESCOM, but South Africans will be saying nothing on Transnet, nothing on Prasa. Nothing on Denel, uh, for example. And I know you don't deal with the specifics of the day-to-day mm -hmm. prosecution of the case, mm -hmm. but I'm asking you to talk to us about the principles then guiding when South Africans will be able to see movement around the other SOEs. So in March this year, we held a, um, a workshop where we said, you know, we want to really identify short-term priorities for impact. We will never be able to do everything. Which are those cases that we can, we can uh, prioritize for impact? And so in the investigating directorate, the, the Istina, Nulani matter, and the Transnet matter are the three matters that have been prioritized on the ID for impact. Um, and then in the uh, space where the SCCU, that's the Specialized Commercial Crime Unit in the NPA, is working with the DPCI, we've got a top ten prioritize cases and those the cases that you mention are in fact the prasa one and two legs one and two are on that top ten and what this means is that we are making sure in fact in the top ten case they meet every single week as a team it's being headed by two deputy national directors in my office advocate rabaji and advocate de Kock. also general labia and general mosipi of the hawks sit on that and so these matters, they are, so rest assured that these very cases that South Africans want to see impact on, they are on our priority list in terms of making sure we can get them to court as soon as possible. So I'm just wondering then, in terms of time frames, um, how soon from, let's say from the top 10 uh, that you, you are talking about where that work is happening, can South Africans expect that new matters will be enrolled by end of this year or... Is it not possible to place a time you know, frame? For me, it's about under-promising and over-delivering, you know. And, and it's very difficult to say in terms of... Because you must understand, the same questions you're asking me, I'm asking people below me, tell me, when can we get these cases sure. to court? So there's a lot of pressure to make sure we get it as soon as possible. But in terms of time frames, I certainly hope that, you know, by the end of the day, end of the year, we'll be able to show will be able to bring a few more impactful cases to court. But I certainly cannot say that that will be the case, but we're certainly aiming to make sure that we can bring these cases to court as soon as possible. So again, with that uh, proviso that you don't yourself, you know, get engaged in the day-to-day -day prosecutions mm -hmm. and decisions, um, you know, as they are made in as far as the conduct of specific matters um, is concerned. But I, I do believe I can ask you about the work around the Guptas trying to get them back into the country. You had a moment where you communicated that uh, the, a red alert notice had been issued uh, for the Guptas, which would enable you know, law enforcement anywhere mm -hmm. in the world to right. hold them pending extradition hearings, etc. And eventually, I think you had to sort of change tack a little bit on that. What is the status? When are we going to see the Guptas on a flight from Dubai to Oartambo International Airport? You know, the reality is we don't know. That is it. I certainly hope that the day will come when we will be able to see them account and be held accountable for, for the damage and devastation that has been caused to the ordinary people of our country by what the allegations are with regard to all of these people. We'll have to prove it in a court of law. But ex mutual legal assistance and extradition are very complicated processes. At the end of the day, let's assume we, they are arrested in a particular country. Depending on the laws of that country, they can then, you know, um, engage in, in legally in that country to try to avoid coming back to South Africa. So these processes, no one really knows. It depends on where they are found, what the legal framework is. And, you know, it could, be, it could take time or it could be quick, depending on, 
you know, where they are arrested. But there certainly are arrest warrants that have been authorized for them. But are you still pursuing the route of a red alert notice oh, uh, yes, for, absolutely. for Interpol to be able to yes. effect an arrest pending those kind of processes? We are, yes, we are. Right. So just as a last question on this theme, the general picture and conviction rates of corruption, are you able to talk a bit more about that? Where, where do we stand? I think I saw some statistics where they were talking about you are hovering somewhere around 160 at the uh, 2019 to 2020. There are about just over 150 in the private sector and just under 200 in that year. And I think in the year 2020 to 21, the number seems to have flipped a little bit in that there was a bit of a higher proportion being public sector than private sector. In driving the message that corruption as a crime does not pay, what are we looking like in terms of securing convictions? Uh, well, what we cannot forget is that we have been hit by COVID in, in the past year. And so, you know, that has had really a, a serious impact in terms of investigations and the prosecutions of these matters. And so, therefore, some of these numbers are not where we would have liked them to have been. But we're looking at corruption, as you correctly say, in the public service as well as in the private sector. And so, in as much as we do have, you know, a number of... I don't have the numbers. Yes, actually, absolutely. A number of convictions in the... And we are, we are also looking at focusing on municipalities. And there have been a number of cases where munis municipal managers and others government employees in municipalities have been arrested and convicted, but we are still nowhere near where we would like to be. And still the resources, remember in that space, the National Prosecuting Authority is as effective as the police and, uh, you know, investigations. We depend on the police to bring us well-investigated cases to take to court. We work very closely with them, particularly in the more complex matters where we work on a prosecutor guided investigation model but it's the capacity within the saps it impacts really greatly on on ultimately the work that the npa can right. do and there's serious challenges in that regard in the saps as well All right before i run out of time let me flip the script on you as it were advocate Batoy. Part of the reason why we ask you these questions about the state capture related uh, you know, prosecution is that we have spent almost a billion rand on the state capture commission mm. of inquiry. And if we draw parallels with history, we had another statutorily established commission of inquiry, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was established in terms of a statute and basically was supposed to then, you know, whatever recommendations were supposed to be followed through. And part of what happened, uh, we now learn from various you know, affidavits that I'm pretty sure you are familiar with is that there seems to have been interference with the ability of the NPA to carry out what was, you know, what it was supposed to do statutorily to prosecute those who were not granted amnesty or those who simply failed to apply for amnesty. Now, you are new in the position, relatively new. You've been there for about, what, two, two sure. and a half years, mm -hmm. almost three years now. What have you done to, to reverse that? Because as we saw recently, uh, the men that died in the Ahmed Timol matter. Mm. Um, victims' families are still begging for answers. The people who are able to give answers, some of them are dying mm. uh, in the process. How long do people have to wait to see prosecutions uh, in as far as apartheid-era crimes and those crimes from the TRC? You know, the fact that, that victims of atrocities committed during the apartheid era are still waiting for justice is in itself an atrocity. Um, it is a serious indictment on our country to have dealt with those issues. And you're right. I mean, there were various reasons why the NPA was not able to deal with it in the past. Since I've taken office, uh, we've engaged with the DPCI. Again, it's the police that would investigate these matters, and then they would come into the NPA space. And so I've worked with General Labia in terms of setting up a dedicated capacity of investigators, researchers, analysts, as well as a dedicated capacity of prosecutors in the NPA. And so we have set up this capacity. Um, we are um, in each of the provinces looking at um, how many cases there are there. We are, recruiting, we are recruiting prosecutors on contract because it's a short term. We are hoping that in, in, you know, if we have a small window because, as you say, witnesses are dying, suspects are dying, family are dying without seeing justice. And so 
We are recruiting people in the various regions. We have a capacity at national office that we've set up um, that is coordinating all of these um, uh, investigations throughout the country to make sure that we're able to bring these cases to court, whether they by means of criminal prosecutions or by way of inquests where we don't have enough evidence. But at the end of the day, the victims need to understand what happened to their loved ones. So we're really hoping that this, this new dedicated capacity that we've mm. set up will be able to, to bring more cases to court. But remember, there are also challenges. These are old cases, and you know, there's, we need the investigative capacity. But we're certainly hoping that in this, we have a short window. So yeah. in the next three years or so, we're able to, to bring these cases to court and make sure that the families of victims do, at the end of the day, get justice. Lastly, ma'am, in July, we saw that situation where our democracy, some would say the foundations of rule of law, were shaken a little bit. They stood in the end uh, with the promise that people would pay for the crimes that they committed during that time. It was all very nice announcing the number of people who were arrested, mm -hmm. but it then fell on you to ensure that it's seen through uh, the prosecution processes. How far are we with that? Um, particularly the whole issue around who were the instigators, mm -hmm. right? Because people, you know, many people will say, yes, it's a crime, uh, those who went and stole a TV and stole eggs and, and, and milk, etc., from a supermarket. Mm -hmm. But if we are suggesting that there was instigation and coordination, how far are we with those prosecutions? So when this happened, we met with the police and set up a, you know, a coordination in order to deal with this, these issues. And we looked at the various categories of offenders. So at the lowest level, you write, you get your, your low-level looters, your opportunistic looters, and those that, yes, you know, we've got to look at poverty, we've got to look at those that simply saw an opportunity and stole these small things. So we deal with that at a level of restorative justice, and really we don't want to make criminals of, of ordinary South Africa. Africans. Then you get the next level where you get those that were more, there was a level of organization where people use vehicles, etc., to steal large quantities. There we deal with it differently. Then you've got your instigators, where those, they were, you know, they were Facebook posts, social media posts, etc., instigating. And then you really get your planners and organizers. At the end of the day, if we want to make sure as a country that this never happens again, those are the people that we need to make sure gets brought to court. So we have uh, colleagues in the NPA, in fact, Andrea Johnson is a deputy in my office that's leading this, working very closely with members of the Hawks, with General Labia, and we have got a team together that is working intensely on making sure that at the end of the day, those most responsible, the ones that were behind planning and organizing this, are the ones that are brought to book. So there's a lot of work going into that. Even these cases take a while to bring. We've got to make mm. sure we get it right. But that is where the focus of our efforts is. All right, Shamila Patre, thank you so much for coming through and en engaging with me here on the Intel on ENCA. She is, of course, the National Director of Public Prosecutions. She's been talking to me about various matters, including corruption. We also touched on issues to do with the TRC and apartheid era uh, prosecutions, as well as what happened in July. And we just refer to it as what happened in July. And you all know what happened in July.